It's so nice to be back here. I mean, uh, uh, I see so many old friends, Pat, Wald, Peter Strauss. I saw, I just see everybody. It's wonderful. And some new friends, too. Uh, what right we're now a special group of senior administrative conference of uh, freaks or whatever, but, but the, we love the administrative conference, uh, and uh, what we've always liked it. I looked up; it is the phoenix, isn't it? I mean, it's come back. It's the phoenix, and so I, lo one, I looked up on the internet. You can do that now. I said, "What's a phoenix?" We'll see if it fits. I, I, I've, I got the definition. It says a phoenix is a mythical bird. Well, all right, uh, with a colorful plumage, well, sort of, uh, and a tail of golden scarlet. Um, or purple, blue, and green, okay. According to some legends, it has a 500 to 1,000 year life cycle. Well, so far. Um, <laughs> near the end of which, it builds itself a nest of twigs and then ignites. That seems to have happened. Who was that uh, immigration judge? Who, <laughs> yes, <laughs> what was his name? It was, he did it. <laughs> and, and then it uh, uh, ignites. It b nest and bird burn fiercely. And uh, they were looking for an agency to eliminate over there, so uh, they burned us and reduced to ashes from which a new young phoenix, da -da, or phoenix egg, arises born anew to live again. The new phoenix is destined to live as long as its old self. That's very good. We want even longer. In some stories, the new phoenix embalms the ashes of its old self in an egg made of mirror and deposits it in the Egyptian city of Heliopolis. I don't know about that one. <laughs> It is said that the bird's cry is that of a beautiful song, and anyone who has read the reports of this, <laughs> its, its ability to be born from its own ashes implies that it is immortal, indeed. Though in some stories, the new phoenix is merely the offspring of the older one, okay? In a very few stories, they are able to change into people, and that's what's happened. <laughs> Pierce, this is true. He's going to write this up. Anyway, it's, it's, it is the phoenix. We love administrative law. Everyone in this room, we say, now the question is why? <laughs> and it, there are many, many, many reasons if you think about it. I mean, uh, for one thing, uh, it, um, it, it gives the, uh, the academics among us, of whom there are a few, something really, really esoteric to talk, to talk about. I mean, we'd love to talk about why. Is there a special exception for rate making in the separation of functions provisions of the APA dealing with it? All right, we un nobody knows the amp. few academics <laughs> can go into that and we will discover it. It's wonderful for the agencies because they have someone really to go into things that are happening in the agency they might not even know about. Paul McAvoy and I wrote a book years and years ago about uh, regulation of energy by the Federal Power, Power Commission and one of the great moments was when we spent quite a lot of time, no one had thought of leaving the ivory tower perhaps in this area before, but we went to the Federal Power Commission. In those days, wasn't it Joe Swidler and uh, uh, Lee White? And there was this building, sort of kind of greenish cement. And we wanted to know how did they actually set a rate? Uh, how? I mean, how do you set the rate for the transmission line? And we kept getting referred to other people. <laughs> And finally, down in the bowels of the basement, we found the person, a very nice woman called Georgia Ladakis. <laughs> and she said, we said, apparently, you're the one who does it. Yes, she said, I do it. No one else did. <laughs> we said, how did you do it? She said, well, what we do is we, you know, we look at comparable industries. Oh, trucks, she said, supermarkets, uh, cereals, <laughs> whatever. And, and then we uh, sort of can't get it exact, but we sort of figured it out. And, and that was the basis for a whole science of cost of service rate making, uh, which later became more refined. It's wonderful for the agencies. And, and of course, for the lawyers, we understand. There were, for the lawyers, uh, several decades, not all of you may know, but where at least 45% of the bar of the Washington, D.C. area made a living from peanut butter. Now, yes, the FDA's famous rule, they were trying to decide how chewy should peanut butter be, and if you added lard, uh, it was not peanut butter, and if you didn't add lard, you couldn't open your mouth. So this is, this, <laughs> this is absolutely true. So, and what, <laughs> what is best, what is best actually is the company, and it always has been. 
I mean, we love to get together. <laughs> Alan Morrison entertained us for years by telling us that Jay Plager, whom some of you know. He's one, here. You, oh, great, Jay is here. Well, then you can tell me if this is true. I've told this story for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But you stopped once in the airport in Denver, and you were, wanted to buy a book, and you went into a bookstore, and uh, uh, it was something to do. You got into a conversation um, um, with a... Uh, foreign-looking gentleman who was selling books. And after a while, you were waiting for the plane, you were talking, he said, what do you do? And he said, I teach administrative law. He said, what? He said, the sale. He said you teach administrative law? I am Chada. That's a true It's all true. Is that a true story? Yes, it is true. And he bought a book from him. Yes, that's right. It is absolutely true. And we used to go to meetings where we would discuss all these things. And Tommy Sussman was always in charge of getting his client, who happened to be the Wine Association of France, <laughs> to come to the meeting and to help, which he did from time to time. So it's wonderful. We've had a very good time over the years, and it's very nice to have you back. There are also our serious things that we do. If you think about it, what I used to tell my classes is the, the true basic question uh, that we all have to answer or help we help answer is quis ipsos custodiat. I say that to my class in order to appear uh, to be very knowledgeable erudite. Who will regulate the regulators? That is a problem that has existed uh, forever, forever. And uh, we in the United States have answers to that. We say, well, the president will try. The president, he will. I mean, I used to tell my class the story about what was his name, who became, uh, how Phil Hyman became uh, 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 a very young age. Uh, became uh, Assistant Secretary of State uh, for something or other, and the reason was because his predecessor, Abba Schwartz, had suddenly got appointed, and uh, uh, by, it was because she was a protege of Eleanor Roosevelt. This was many years ago. And uh, uh, he discovered that he was the boss of uh, a woman called Frances Knight. That name means little to you, but she was known as the Dragon Lady equivalent of J. Edgar Hoover over in the State Department. And she would not give visas to anyone she didn't like. And uh, this was a bete noir of people like Abba Schwartz, who being a protege of Eleanor Roosevelt, was a good liberal. So he thought, she, she works for me. Great, I'll fire her. <laughs> or at least transfer her to Idaho. And I say the, the smallest time limit ever measured by the human brain or any scientist was the period of time that passed between the instant that he fired her and the instant she fired him. <laughs> 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 so so uh, I say, usually, uh, but didn't the president intervene? What do you mean the president intervened? Of course not. He has a lot to do. And unfortunately, a lot of, or fortunately, perhaps, these questions don't necessarily go to his agenda. Well, Congress. I mean, Congress. Well, in a sense. But Congress has delegated the power to uh, 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 make the decisions you make to you. And if they had time to make them all, why'd they delegate it? And they don't, and they don't have the expertise, etc. Well, the judges, the judges love to think that they're the ones who are controlling what goes on in the agencies. And uh, they do to a degree, but it's a very big envelope uh, that they can't get beyond. Uh, because they just have to say, is it arbitrary, capricious, abuse of discretion uh, for talking about policy? And they have other things that they apply. But still, it leaves this vast area, this vast area where it's just up to the agency. And so we call in another tier of groups. On the substantive side, it's OIRA, which has gone under many, many different faces, many different names. But it's been there since President Nixon. And it sort of polices a lot of the substance of what goes on. And then we have, when Americans complain, that's Walter Gellhorn, our ombudsman. And who is our ombudsman? Our ombudsman really are the caseworkers in Congress. Because when somebody gets into trouble, they call the member of Congress, and then the member of Congress sends a, from his machine somebody, uh, something to the agency. And then who is it that tries to see that this thing is really working smoothly, that one agency can learn from another, that they follow fair procedures, and occasionally we delve into the substance of it so we can control through advice, sound advice, substance, procedure, learning one from the other, Agency to agency, bar to academy to agency, our heroes, <laughs> the Administrative Conference of the United States. So there we are. And that is an just important job. We yeah. Now, I would like to point out that just by chance two days ago, somebody sent to me 
a very, very interesting article that was printed in China. And he said that the magazine in Ch the, um, uh, so I have it here. I, I, I don't know if I have the, the name. I, I didn't put it on here. But, but it's a very distinguished journal in China and is not uh, either rebel or uh, establishment. And people read it and they listen to it and they do it. And they were talking about rule of law in China. And they said, we really mean a rule of law, not a rule by law that two or three people make up, a rule of law. And they listed a number of areas uh, where they thought it was important to actually focus on this. And one was the legislature, and another were the courts. They wanted an independent judiciary. And another, at the same time, two major problems in administration must be tackled. One is lack of transparency. Government officials often operate in a chaotic way without proper procedures. And many local governments make up rules while bypassing existing laws. Second, the exercise of administrative power lacks clear limits. Government officials, and then they go on and complain. So I thought, who are they asking? What questions? And I thought, well, we're, we're being asked here. Because sometimes when I talk uh, to foreign groups, I say, I know it's important to have a constitution, and it is. And I know it's important to protect human liberty, and it certainly is. And you can list a lot of provisions. But I'd say, I'd like to have in that list of things that you're going to put in, just one that you'll not think of. And that is a rule called, what's a rule? And a rule or a law is public. And if it isn't public, it's not a law. I said, that's a principle of administrative law. That is a principle that our government follows. There is no such thing as a secret law. And therefore, to our, we are transparent. Good advice, wouldn't it? Who'd give them that advice? We would in this room. And when we think, how are we going to control the uncontrollable? <laughs> how are we going to control? There we have two or three more courses of administrative law to teach. And we also have the experience of the people in this room to draw upon. Uh, so what we're doing has national and international implications. And of course, I, being very biased, think it's for the better. So I am delighted that Phoenix Light, you have arisen from the ashes, and we have a new and an old group as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, do you want to take a few questions? Sure. The Justice will receive questions from the assembled experts on fields even beyond administrative law, I, <laughs> I expect. I'm, I'm John Siegel. I'm the uh, research and policy director for, for the conference. Uh, Mr. Justice, what projects would you recommend that the conference take up? <laughs> well, you're better at that than I. I, I mean, uh, I haven't thought about this in too long a time. You know, but there are lots. I mean, to find out what is annoying people the most about each other. <laughs> 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 and out of that, undoubtedly, things will emerge. I mean, there is a lot. There, there is so, so. So, so much. Is there anything that's um, come up in, uh, we've, only, we've only gotten, we don't get that many administrative, we get some administrative law cases. Uh, I don't have good advice on that. I haven't thought it through. If I think it through, I'll let him know. All right. Yes. Uh, Mr. Justice, you said if it's um, not public, it's, it's not a law. Uh, would that include things like building codes and statutes with copyrights that are only available um, with a credit card? Are those laws? Is that a law? Uh, a well, a, a lot of um, laws. Yeah, are there building know? codes that aren't? There building codes that they keep secret. Uh, All right, nope. there's your project. Great. Uh, but no, but they do cost a hundred dollars. <laughs> oh, they what? They, they cost a hundred dollars. I mean, you can get them, but you have to pay a hundred dollars. Yeah, is that public? Well, that's it. I don't know. I'm not expressing a legal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's a problem of. Uh, Wealth problem. That's we have a lot. That's of that's Carl Malamud back there, whose project, as we all know, is data.gov, and he is. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I'm sorry. Are you right? Put, can law. you not put them? Oh, I see. You want to put them online so but that people. But he wants to get rid of secret they, law because you shouldn't have to pay for it, and he's got a very good point. Yeah, that's a good point. That's fine. Well, so far I've given terrific answers to your first two questions. <laughs> <laughs> so. so um, Oh, I got to tell one story, as long as I don't see any hands up. And that has to do with your earlier point about who's in charge and who can fire who. And I just saw on the 
the Civil Rights Commission has a website, and there is this, ju uh, only in Louisiana, there is this uh, Justice of the Peace in Louisiana who refuses to uh, perform interracial marriages. And he's been doing, refusing to perform all these years. And so the Civil Rights Commission wrote him and said, you know, Loving versus Virginia was decided in 1967. And uh, so then he didn't do anything, and then they went up, apparently he has to report to somebody. Uh, and so they finally went after him, and, and after all these years, he resigned. Uh, but that shows you sometimes how long it takes to get the word out. Um, it, it, I mean, that is only amazing. You might look at reinventing government. Do you remember that study? Uh, and uh, th uh, it seemed to me they went into all kinds of things. And I don't know if all that's been implemented or if it's, uh, I don't know whatever happened to it. That might be a source. Actually, I do have my favorites to look into, but I'm going to tell him privately. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Justice, since we've gone off of the administrative law page, uh, could you uh, speculate or discuss what you would uh, consider the most important Supreme Court decision uh, and why? Oh, well, I mean, everybody's, I think people would come down to two. They'd probably say Brown would certainly be one uh, because it created a single country. And uh, uh, the uh, other would be Marbury, you know, because you, you, you couldn't quite get that off the list. So I don't have, <laughs> so I don't have, I don't have anything really unusual in that. I think probably nine people out of ten. But I, I'll, I, I talk about this some, and I, I had, when I, uh, do I usually say, I hope there's one I hope you won't forget. Uh, it's not the, blah, I think Brown is perhaps the most important maybe, but I'd like to talk, and I wrote about it, uh, uh, Cooper versus Aaron. And the reason I talk about that, I say the following, that, that after Brown, which many of you know, it was decided in 1954, and the next thing that happened over the next year, what happened? Exactly what you're saying, nothing. <laughs> Well, let's not exaggerate. Next to nothing. Virtually nothing. And then 1956, and what happened? Right. <laughs> and same thing happened again. And then in early 57 in Little Rock, the uh, uh, district judge uh, ordered the Little Rock board to integrate. That's where the Little Rock Nine came in. And the Little Rock Nine were going to enter the Central High School in uh, September 1957. And during that summer, as mo most of you know, Governor Faubus decided that uh, he would sort of move to the side of the White Citizens Council. And on that early September morning, when they were supposed to come there under the order of the judge, after he'd exhausted about every legal maneuver, the White Citizens Councils were stand, sound, you know, they were sound, they, they're, they're surrounding the school, and uh, uh, the militia is in uh, the, under the orders of Governor Faubus. And they were there, but they weren't there to let anybody in. Uh, they were there to keep them out. And uh, one uh, girl, Elizabeth Egford, very dignified, you know, there were these nine. They were pretty brave and they were pretty, uh, they were careful what they did. But she didn't get the message that she wasn't supposed to be where she was, and she started walking towards the school. And someone snapped a picture of a white woman's face behind her, enraged. And she's looking very dignified as she walked in. That picture went around the world. And uh, uh, there were news people, all kinds of noise, and they couldn't get in the school. So Brooks Hayes, who was the congressman from, from Little Rock, called President Eisenhower and arranged for a meeting between Eisenhower and uh, Falbus. And he went to the Newton, he went up to Newport, where they been for the summer White House, and he met with Eisenhower, and he said uh, afterwards that it was like a general dressing down a sergeant. Uh, and he told Eisenhower he would integrate, and he didn't. He told the news people he wouldn't. And so that pretty much annoyed Eisenhower. What was interesting to me about what he was then going to do is he called in advice, and he got advice from Jimmy Burns. Jimmy Burns had been a member of our court, and he'd resigned in World War II uh, to help run the domestic uh, uh, mobilization effort, and then he was governor of South Carolina. He was not a bigot. Uh, he, was not a, he was a great advisor to Harry Truman, but he met with Eisenhower and he said, I know the South, and if you send troops into Little Rock, you're going to have to have a second reconstruction. You will have to reoccupy the entire South, and the best thing that will happen will be uh, they'll close the schools, and nobody will be educated. So you better not do it. And uh, Brownell, his uh, attorney general, said, you have to. You've got to do this. 
And Eisenhower, which was a, yes, in retrospect, obvious, not, not obvious at the time, he said, I'm doing this. And he called up the 101st Airborne. The 101st Airborne, as we know, uh, at that time, uh, was uh, everyone in the United States knew who they were. They were uh, the heroes of Normandy. They had parachuted in. Their parachutes had hung up on the uh, steeples, uh, where a lot of them were shot down. They were heroes of the Battle of the Bulge. Everyone, every American knew who they were. And he purposely called that division. And he put 1,000 of them on airplanes, and he flew them uh, uh, into Little Rock. And the next day, they got those children, and they walked with those children right into that school. And they took other pictures, and those went around the world. And that was a much happier story. It was a very interesting, that story. But I want to tell that story, and I like the case, because most people think that flowed from Cooper Vieira. No, it didn't. It was afterwards when they had to withdraw because they can't stay there forever. And a new board is elected, White Citizens Council Board. And they say, we're not going to do this anymore. Bring a case, tell them we can't, too much violence, da, 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 da. And it gets up to the Supreme Court by the end of the next summer. And uh, the Supreme Court then says, you have to do it. You do it, of course you have to. And they all signed it, all nine, all nine. They all signed it, okay? And uh, that's because they wanted to show that you really have to do it. But they're nine people, nine people called judges. It could have been 9,000. They didn't have troops. I mean, the paratroopers had gone home. And the day after they wrote that decision, the day after they reached their decision, saying, of course you have to continue to do this, Governor Falbus closed the schools. And Little Rock High School was closed. Central High School was closed. It was closed until for the rest of the year. And it was closed. Nobody got education, any education. You go read an article in Sports Illustrated where they found many, many years later, in many of the class of 1950, uh, of that class that was there in 1957, uh, 58, and so forth. And uh, a lot, their lives, a lot of them were really hurt, really hurt. Well. You say, it didn't have a happy ending. Ah, yes, I think it did, of course. You see, I think it did. Because like it or not, they couldn't keep that up. And they had, finally the people in Little Rock said, no, 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 we can't have this board. And they elected another board, and they opened the schools, and they came back, and so forth. And that was the beginning of something. But I like to tell that story about Cooper and Aaron, because of course it was the right decision. I told it to a Russian paratroop general who came over. He had been in charge, the State Department called us and said, you see, he had all his missiles pointing toward the United States. He's uh, shifted the direction, so we should be nice to this man. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we brought him over, and uh, he said, well, just what you said, what's the case? And I said, I just don't want you to forget that case. And I told him that story, and I said, you see, it shows the paratroopers and the judges must be friends. Uh, uh, but, 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 but what it really shows with all that, what it really shows with all that, is both the need, the optimism, the difficulty of the simple thing of getting people to follow a law. Okay? And we sort of have it, we think, knock on wood. But I mean, we can remember that period. My goodness, touch and go. And so I think that case was a beginning, and I love that case for that reason, and I love the fact that he sent the paratroopers, and I love the fact of what happened, but it also did all work out. And uh, that's what we're part of in the law. I mean, we're, we're part of something that goes uh, well beyond uh, uh, the one million people who are lawyers. There are actually 308 million people in the United States who are not lawyers. Uh, it's hard to believe. <laughs> but, but you do. I mean, they're the ones. They're the ones who have to understand what we do. And they're the ones that have to understand the importance of it. And they're the ones that understand that sometimes we judges are wrong. And they're the ones that have to understand what we do is quite often, blah, 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 et cetera. It's a speech. But nonetheless, you see the point. You wanted to know why I think that's important or what's that? I think that's very important. Well, thank you.